Good morning and welcome. Good morning and welcome to the Superintendent Community Update for Friday, November 5th. Uh, right here in, in the month of November already. Cold morning. <laughs> Cold morning this morning. Uh, I guess get a little warmer this weekend. But uh, again, welcome to uh, welcome to Friday. Uh, and uh, got some great news for you today and, and a nice little update. So to really start with positive news, news as I, I really try to start each each update with. And so Baldwin, Baldwin, uh, Whitehall and Baldwin High School being in the news this week um, for good things, right? Uh, so Rear Admiral Susan Orsega will be in town Monday night for the Steeler game. Uh, so if you remember, uh, she was our acting Surgeon General back from January, I believe, until about March. Uh, and so graduated in, in 1986 when we graduated high school, went to high school together and graduated together. And so uh, I've known Susie for a very long time, but now it's Rear Admiral Susan Orsega. Uh, but she will be honored Monday at the Steelers game. Uh, so Monday night football, uh, the NFL does different types of tributes to service. They have a program during the month of November, and uh, that will happen on Monday. And so Baldwin High School, Baldwin Whitehall, and of course the Pittsburgh region being recognized for uh, with with Susie's uh, and Susan's accomplishments. So I uh, greatly look forward to that. And uh, congratulations once again to Susan for, for your work and thank you for your work. Uh, school board elections this past month, or this past week, excuse me, uh, this past week uh, with school board elections, uh, just to recap, re-elected uh, Mrs. Karen Brown and Mrs. Amanda Priano. So Karen will be moving forward into her ninth year of service. So she's uh, wrapping up her eighth year this month, uh, along with Dave Sollin, they wrapped up eight years of service. And so Mrs. Brown will be heading into the uh, rarefied air of, uh, of double digit service as we move forward between her ninth and 12th year uh, moving forward into these next four years. So congratulations to her and congratulations to uh, Amanda uh, as you move forward uh, into your first full term. Uh, uh, newly elected, Mr. Greg Zeman. Uh, Greg, uh, a Baldwin grad, I've known Greg for a very, very long time. Uh, not quite since high school because he's a few years younger than me, so we did not go to high school and we were not at Baldwin at the same time, at least I don't believe that we were. Uh, but, but Greg and his family have, have been uh, Baldwin residents for, for a long time. The kids go, going through the district and even uh, uh, doing some really work post-graduate, uh, doing uh, with our football, our football announcing and, and doing the streaming of the games. Tyler has been doing some great work there, um, and just really uh, congratulations to you. Congratulations also newly elected Miss, Miss Melissa Wood. Uh, Melissa has also been a supporter of the Ball 1L School District uh, for many years, um, and so we are really pleased to uh, have both of you coming on board. Saying goodbye, so when, anytime you have new folks coming in, you're also saying goodbye. So saying goodbye to Mr. Dave Solanday after eight years of service. Uh, and Mr. Jerry Pantone after four years of service. So thank you to uh, both of those gentlemen for their work for the children, uh, for the staff of the Baldwin and the community, of course, uh, of Baldwin Whitehall. And uh, we look forward to seeing what lies ahead for both of you. Uh, just board meeting notes of note. Uh, two different reports were given this past week at the board meeting. We had the auditor report. Uh, Mr. Chad Agnew was, was here. Um, virtual, I should say, uh, given the auditor, the audit report for the 2020-2021 school year. We went into that year really with so many unknowns. Uh, with the pandemic being concerned about collection rates, uh, earned income tax, uh, and, and again, collection rate of, of just uh, uh, property taxes, because with the pandemic, folks being out of work, um, what might that mean for for collections and revenue, and, and that really could could have been problematic. And a lot of those things did not come true, and in really spectacular fashion, as the Baldwin Wild community has always been, uh, really being forthright and, and, and paying taxes on time. And, and those collections came in; people still uh, were at work, um, and so EIT and some of those other revenue streams that every one of the experts predicted and, and advised school districts to to scale back on what the expectations were, scale back on, on how much money you think you're gonna be getting in from earned income tax or EIT, scale back on what you think your collection rate would be. Historically, Baldwin Whitehall has collected taxes at this 96 uh, plus percent rate. 
um, much higher than many of our neighbors. Um, I know of districts that, that collect 60, 70, 80 percent of their taxes. And so um, there's a lot of delinquent taxes out there. But Baldwin has always collected at that 96 mark. They said you better scale back 20, 25 percent. So we built a budget based upon a 90 percent collection rate. Uh, and, and but what we saw is that basically it came in at 92. So still there were there were some challenges. It, it was not at the, the the rate which we uh, have have grown to uh, be accustomed to, uh, but it was higher than expected, and that has a positive impact in revenue. And so um, again, it was great news. Uh, the board always asked Mr. Agnew for a grade. Uh, he did deliver a grade. It was an A plus. So um, of course, in a world you know school world built upon grades and, and what the grading scale is, uh, it, it was good news for the board, it was good news for the community, and of course, just being um, in a stable financial position is really important. Uh, because there's always places to spend money. And um, I had Ms. Gallagher, Ms. Marissa Gallagher, uh, give an update for student services because you, know, you think about the unpredictability of student services um, and with different differing needs that, uh, different needs of children that essentially can change every day. And, and when those changes happen, uh, they cost money. So a child that may need a placement that you didn't didn't plan on or new enro new enrollments that uh, children come in with uh, identified learning needs uh, or placement needs and things of that nature. Um, so there is there is a unpredictability of a budget. The budget's only good on the day that it's written. After that, it's, it's changing all the time. Uh, and student services have been changing all the time as well. And so um, Ms. Gallagher was able to give a, a, the board just, a, I thought, just a fantastic update of where our numbers are, uh, you know, how many students, what type of programs we're running, what, what's our staffing number look like, uh, but also got it. So that was like the, the quantitative, the, the number side of the presentation, um, and it was, was really, really solid. But then we got into the qualitative side, you know, what, what are the feel-good stories? And there are so many of them. The, the kids and the programs and the teachers and the way the, uh, the interactions and, and, and how we want to build programs, keeping our kids here within the Baldwin and Whitehall community, it's really powerful. Um, a lot of districts place students out into uh, other placements, uh, that's, the, that's the, the term and the name, uh, because they may not have programming to handle student needs of, of that severity or of, that, of, of being that complex. Um, and I'll give you one example. There, there's one local, um, one local placement, one local institution, uh, school that, that we do send some students to. We have, I think it's five. I saw one, one report. I thought it was six. Uh, Ms. Gallagher informed me that she thought it was down to five because we've had one student transition out of there and back to Baldwin High School. So of our district size of 4,600 students roughly, uh, we have five students in, in that placement. Uh, sometimes because uh, children move into our district and they're already in that placement, that they've, they've grown accustomed to that, um, or just simply out of, out of need because of some of the things that we're working through. So we're one of the largest districts in the South Hills. We have five students there. Um, there are other districts that are much, much smaller of a thousand students. And I won't name them by name. It's not, that's not necessary, but um, other students or other schools that are sending students to those schools, uh, districts of a, of a size of a thousand or 1300 where they're, they're sending 20 and 25 children um, to those programs. Um, I'm not throwing stones because I'm not in those districts, but here's what I do know. Those types of placements are very expensive. And so they, 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 they really take a hit on your budget. If you're able to do that type of programming in your school, yes, you may have to add staff, uh, but you're not dealing with transportation and vehicles leaving your district and, and potentially not being able to serve those transportation needs. But by keeping the children in your own school district, in your own schools, I mean, the children really have the ability to, to form those connections to the kids that they live near, community members, and really be part of that school community. So there was great power in that. And, and Marissa was able to share with the board and the public um, some of those stories, our partner models, um, the Baldwin Bean, uh, the, I don't have the name of it here properly, uh, but with the new fabrication or, or uh, maker type of initiative at the high school. Um, I think it's like Innovation Studio, but I probably have that wrong. Uh, but sharing those types of programs that are all just great uh, for all children, whether it's a child with special needs, 
um, or a child without special needs that can really serve as the mentor and the peer. So the board meeting was really full of positive, positive information in that way. Of course, business was, was taken care of. Um, I, again, I apologize that it had to be remote. Um, and I apologize because we had some great recognition. We, we had some, some uh, I'll consider them um, really uh, folks that stepped up uh, one morning when a child got hurt. So good Samaritans that really stepped up and helped out. Uh, recognition of board members, uh, recognition of our national merit uh, finalists. Uh, and so those are all things that could have been much easier if you're in person. It's very difficult if you're not in person. Um, so moving forward, and again, just thank you for uh, to, to Chad and to Marissa for providing those updates uh, to the board this past week. Parent-teacher conferences coming up soon, Thursday, November 18th. Uh, students in grades K through 8. Uh, and remember, that's a asynchronous learning day for the K-8 students. It's a synchronous learning day, still remote, uh, for the students in grades 9 through 12. Um, again, all students remote. Uh, so today, just a note from Mrs. Huffman uh, and Mrs. Fleming Salopec, uh, today, 11-5, is the last day for families, the K-8 to families, to sign up for a parent-teacher conference. Uh, please be reminded, her notes, uh, please be reminded that K-5 to families must schedule a conference through their child's homeroom teacher while the grade six through eight families must schedule a conference with one teacher of choice. We know that those schedules are created a little differently where you have like a homeroom structure in that K-5, even if they have shared teachers. Uh, and then also uh, you have different periods of the day in grades six through eight. So uh, schedule with the homeroom teacher if you're K-5, schedule with your teacher of choice six to eight. Remember, one of the good things coming out of COVID, I know we don't often say that or put those things in the same sentence, good and COVID. Uh, but conferences can either be in person or virtual. So if it's a matter of, of work schedules or child care or, or 100 other things, uh, if parents are not able to come into the building, uh, you can still, you can still uh, have that meeting with your teacher in a virtual, in a virtual environment. So um, that is one benefit and thing that we've learned coming out of uh, or working through this pandemic. Speaking of pandemics, just a couple updates. So a COVID update, uh, as, as you probably have known by now, I did have to shut down the administration the administration offices this week. So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, just really out of an abundance of caution. Uh, we had a few cases confirmed. We had a few uh, cases of just illness that were not confirmed yet. And um, just with the, the, the tight nature of work in those spaces, even with the um, the mitigation strategies that were in place, um, I just couldn't be confident that uh, there, there was not any additional risk. And so it was my decision to, to close things down. Uh, today being the last day of that closure, we'll be back in person uh, on Monday. Uh, and we'll make sure that our mitigation strategies will tighten those up even a little bit further and, and, and go a little bit further than, than potentially that we did before. And so um, everyone's been working from home. If there's been any challenges reaching out uh, to folks, uh, please uh, communicate to 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 your principals. Uh, principals are communicating to central office. Uh, so if there's any challenges, I apologize. Please please let us know, and we'll get that fixed. Uh, a few student cases, and student cases seem to just to be steady. I'm not seeing any particular spikes anywhere. Um, there are several student cases that we're working through, and there is a question a little bit later in regard to the. Um, the letters that get passed out or here get sent home in the timing of those. So I'll address that with the questions that are coming up in a little bit. I do have an update from Mrs. Sprouse in regard to vaccines. Please remember vaccines are not mandated. That was a question that came up at the board level from, from a resident. Uh, the district is providing the opportunity for children to be vaccinated. That will not be without any parent consent. Let me say that again parent consent will must be received. Let me say that as clear as I can. Parent consent must be received in order for any student to receive a vaccine. The vaccine as we as we do those in the school is really just as a service to our community. Um, schools, I mean, think about it even within our mission statement, within our values, that the schools are a resource to the community. They always have been. Whether it's you know, grabbing a a permit for you know Thursday night men's basketball, a bunch, you know a bunch of buddies playing ball, and they get a permit to use the gym. It's a resource. 
So this is a, a different extension of that. So let's not overthink that, and we are not playing uh, with anyone to, to mandate anything. Please understand that. So here we go. We're scheduled for Friday, November 12th. That's next Friday at Baller High School. Um, as of right now, we'll be offering uh, all of the booster shots for COVID. So the first and second dose COVID vaccines, the Pfizer, the Moderna, um, and J&J. &J. Uh, the flu vaccine. Uh, we've been monitoring, uh, as of the notes that I had here from Mrs. Sprouls, we were monitoring the, uh, the outcome of the the vaccine for at the ages 5 to 11. We know that that is approved now, and so we'll get some, some updates. Uh, I don't want to make just simply the assumption that, that the ages 5 to 11 can, can just join this because I don't have that confirmed, uh, but I will get that updated uh, prior to next Friday and get that pushed out to you because we do know that that has been fully approved uh, by, the, by the CDC at this time. Um, there's also a vaccine clinic already reserved for Saturday, November 20th. Uh, so we, that, that would allow us to provide more opportunities to our staff, um, our students as appropriate, and of course our community. So next Friday and then the Saturday after. Things opening back up, the Baldwin Bean opened this week. So the Baldwin Bean, if you're familiar with that, uh, it is a coffee shop in Baldwin High School operated by our students. So we utilize the Parker's model for so students that are um, receiving transitional types of services that need that vocational work, interacting with the public, uh, communication types of goals. It's a great opportunity where um, they, they can really serve uh, their classmates or their staff um, in this type of environment. It's a small coffee shop. Um, it was closed all of last year, but we really were pushing to have it back open for this year, so it did open this week. Just a little bit of the history lesson on the ball and bean. It was really the, the brainchild of um, high school high school teachers, along with Miss Gallagher and Miss Weber, uh, Mr. Jankowski at the high school. Just thinking about how we can provide those types of experiences for children and not have them leave the building. Of course, we could always run children to different experiences like Giant Eagle and Good and, and, and Goodwill and, and things of that nature. But how can we do that right in our district, in our schools, to make it more convenient and maybe more meaningful? And so through a collaboration between the school, between the educational foundation, uh, the local police forces and the, and the county police, really coming together with different uh, funding sources, putting together a coffee shop. Um, and it's really been something just fantastic. Um, of note of that, I had an opportunity last Friday, uh, Baldwin Whitehall is part of Shazda, South Hills Area School District Association, or Shazda. Uh, so there's about 26 districts that uh, in the southern part of Allegheny County, Washington County, uh, we meet monthly. We've, we've not been meeting in person for such a long time, but our first in-person meeting was last Friday and we held it um, at the Bean. Typically in years past, we would just meet monthly at a restaurant uh, and, and really it was a monthly lunch to have a, a working lunch discussion of a variety of different things, uh, put, putting together a program and an agenda. But we've talked about how can we share the great things that are happening in, in, in each of our schools and each of our school districts. Um, there is so much energy in Western Pennsylvania, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. How can we share that? How can we see what's happening in our neighbors? Why do we have to fly across the country, drive, drive a few hours when there's so much energy right here? So we thought no better way than let's just get ourselves out and about. Uh, for our Shazda superintendent meetings. And so the first one was last Friday. We showcased the Baldwin Bean. It was just outstanding. Um, and thank you to Eddie and Alex, a couple of our students who just really were just such great student ambassadors to the superintendents. Uh, I'm, I'm at a, a meeting the last couple of days with superintendents and, and they're still talking about it. They're still talking about their experience that they had at Baldwin High School and the students and the way they were treated. Uh, just, just fantastic stuff. Uh, but we all, we also were able to visit the Chill Room, which is up on our third floor. And the Chill Project is something that was started by Allegheny Health Network (AHN). It was a concept by Dr. Will Davies. Came to uh, Marissa and myself about four years ago, really pitching an idea about how can we provide better supports for students um, in a a non-hospital setting. Uh, when kids really need that type of support, they, they need guidance, they, they, they need counseling, they, need, they may need therapy. So what does that look like? What is the first level, like an entry level, tier one type of thing look like? 
and how do you build those supports along the way. So the chill room and the chill program uh, became alive. At this conference that I'm at these last couple of days, Dr. Davies was here, and he really credited Baldwin High School and the Baldwin White Hall School District as the the genesis of this. This is where this started, and now they're in all four corners of Allegheny County. Uh, so us to the south, the east, the west, and of course to the north. I think it all started at Baldwin High School. It started that day in our boardroom with that conversation, and, and it is just incredible, incredible work. So. He presented to, to the Shazda superintendents last week. He just presented to all of Allegheny County superintendents yesterday. Uh, maybe it was Wednesday, but either way. Um, and he's really talking about how it all started at Ball High School. So that's, that's to me, that's pretty cool. Um, so a little bit more about Western Pennsylvania and how Western PA is really a leader right now in educational reform. And, and, and a couple new things for me. I, I knew that across our region there's just so many cool things that are happening we have nine districts from western pennsylvania that are participating in the the digital promise league of innovative league of innovative schools um, there's no other concentration of districts like that from anywhere in the country there are about 32 districts participating in the uh, aasa uh, it's a superintendent's uh, group uh, but they have a, a program called the 2025 that talking about how to how to to um, rethink our schools and the time is now and it has we have to be done by 2025 or we're going to miss our opportunity. So there's an incredible energy nationwide, and of those hundreds of districts, there's 31 right here in Western Pennsylvania, Allegheny County, Washington County, Westmoreland County, that are participating in this and really being supported through some of our local partners like Grable. And then speaking of Grable, uh, Mr. Greg Bear. The executive director he was here last evening giving comments and his comments were just incredibly powerful talking about these same things the asa program digital promise these all these districts but then he was sharing things i i had not heard before that there's conferences ha happening and of course he's been joining these things via zoom because there's not a need to travel to all, all these places especially across uh, across the seas but talking about these international conferences where the discussion at these conferences is what's happening right here in Western Pennsylvania. So in Finland, uh, in Japan, we always get compared to Japan and, and you know, they're saying how far behind. But the, the rest of the world is paying attention to some of the innovation in schools that's happening right here. And that's pretty powerful. Um, if that doesn't get you excited about what we do, I'm not sure what will. Um, and so I, I've been saying for a while, and I guess it, it, I'm on the right track, <laughs> I hope I am, uh, that every industry goes through a transformational process and a, a transformational period of time. Whether it's the fast food industry and when McDonald's and Burger King and those different places uh, basically created their, uh, their programs and, and, and their industry, whether it's a car industry, uh, whether it's ice cream, whether it's Hershey's chocolate, Every industry either transforms, they update, they innovate, or they die. And I think we're right in the middle of it right now. So there's opportunity. There are there are dollars. Yes, you know the district has been criticized for accepting federal dollars. Well, let's face it, the districts here and everywhere we've always accepted state dollars. This the state and the model is built upon a fair share formula it's, it's it's not great but and it's not fair yet it's not equal but the entire burden of educating children in a community does not fall to just that community it is local dollars it is a state system state process state funding um, as well as federal dollars federal is about one or two percent of our budget state somewhere around 20 percent give or take of our budget and then local is up in that 77 uh, 70 plus percent even more um, of our budget but now is the time because the dollars are there to really support this and so using those dollars for things that will really provide impact for a legacy of children a generation of children um, not just paying the bills or keeping the lights on so that is pretty powerful and so when, when mr uh, mr bear talked about that last night and that the rest of the world is watching uh, it's humbling 
it, it really was kind of humbling. And, and we're right here in the middle of it, and, and we're doing some fantastic things. And so we should be proud of that. We really need to be proud of that. Another conversation that came up Wednesday night, and then just a topic, and I'm not going to get super deep into this because I think it's really a, a misunderstood topic, and I'm more than happy to jump in uh, with folks individually on this and, and help me to understand kind of where folks are coming from. But the idea of diversity and, and, and working within the curriculum and, the, and even CRT, critical race theory, uh, there's a lot of conversation around what schools are doing or, or are being accused of doing and what they're not doing. Let me just take a minute and, and talk about this. And again, I'm not going to get that deep into it. You know, school districts teach diversity. We always have. The approved curriculum that is can, can be viewed by anyone at any time talks about diversity. You know, from the earliest stages of, of what we do within social studies curriculums at the kindergarten level, we're, when we're learning about the community uh, or we're learning about the state. I mean, we, we start small. We start with with what happens right around children. And then we go into like cities and neighborhoods. Then we go into states. Then we go into the U US history and then world history. So that, that model and that progression of curriculum where we're talking about the worlds around us, um, diversity always has been a topic. Uh, it was a topic when we were in school. And of course, that's a very, very long time ago. The Baldwin Whitehall School District was really thrust into that in a, in a new way, potentially in the 1990s when the immigrant and refugee population here really just exploded. And, and they weren't always easy conversations. I've been here long enough, I've, and I've lived here my entire life, but I've been here professionally long enough where I know that meeting rooms at borough buildings or in libraries were filled with part of the population that was really about send them back. We don't want them here. Um, and we've grown so much over the past 25 to 30 years. And I think that Baldwin Whitehall is recognized as a leader in the education of immigrant and refugee populations. We've been doing it for, for such a long time. Other districts also take notice of what we are doing and what we've been able to accomplish. And sometimes through some pretty difficult situations when, when children come and they have really no formal education, no formal experiences, and, and they're in classrooms or working in some pull-out programs uh, within a English second language type of classroom. Uh, and, and how do you work through those things? So we have been a leader. Districts come, come to us and, and, and ask how you do that. Show us what you've done. Because now they may have five, six, ten students. Um, all in Whitehall right now is probably sitting in the number of 500, uh, 500 plus. Uh, and it's been that way for quite a long time. Uh, so we've always taught diversity, and, we'll, and I believe that, that we would always be continuing to teach diversity. Uh, CRT, or critical race theory, is not an approved curriculum. Not at the state level, not at the Baltimore Whitehall level. It's not a course of study designed, at least from my readings and my research and my, my beliefs as your superintendent, it's not appropriate in the K-12 environment. Uh, but what I do want to say is that in this age of COVID, as we work through this, the curriculum is, is more transparent than ever. So there is a curriculum review process. In fact, uh, Mrs. Hoffman and, and Mrs. Fleming Salopec had the board relook at that just this past week, uh, putting the timelines out there as to what that cycle looks like. When when will we, when do we view each subject? When do we replace materials? Um, what does the curriculum writing look like? So that's a five-year or six-year model that that was put forth just to the board this past Wednesday. So, um, but our review process um, at the district level with what we do with professionals is very outlined. And then there's also a curriculum review process for parents that if you're concerned about something in particular, where our policies support it, there's, there's the ability to, to review whatever materials you may, may have in question. Because I, I've gotten stopped more frequently in the last few weeks um, than, than prior, but with questions, are, you know, are you teaching that stuff? But the, the, the but what and where and, and, and there's been not specific. So I'd like to dig into that if I can. And so I ask folks, take a look at, at students' Canvas pages. Um, so in this pandemic age, the access to the curriculum and what kids are learning, 
mean, maybe it's not the full blown every bit of the curriculum, but the individual assignments, the readings, all of these things are available right there um, on a Canvas page because we've had to make our curriculum more portable and more accessible uh, for everybody. So that information is there for you. If there are specific concerns that need to be addressed, um, I want to know about those. I want to take a look and see where there are specific concerns. Uh, if there is, because it happens before, it may, it may be around this topic, it may be around something else. It might be concern about the use of certain language in, 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 a, in a novel or something like that. So let's maintain the conversation. Uh, and I think that was part of, of what my takeaway from some of the topics that, that I've even been involved with over the past few months uh, on, on, this, on, on this concern. Let's continue the conversation. Let's talk about where there may be areas of, of specific concern or what, what would people might be looking at or, or thinking about. And let's have the conversation and see what we can work through. Uh, but, but once again, um, it is not an approved curriculum, not at the state level and not at the local level. All curriculum needs to be approved through our board. And um, it's, it's not a behind the veil type of process. It's a very open and transparent process. Um, but as we're talking about diversity, I do want to shift gears and talk a little bit about one thing we're right in the middle of. And I'll probably, probably do poorly with the names, and, and I apologize. But I do want to wish our, our families that are celebrating the Diwali um, holiday happiness, pros, prosperity, and joy. And so let's let's break this down a little bit. So it's commonly, commonly called Tihar, um, but it's also not known as Deepawali. And Tihar is collectively the five-day celebration, Tuesday through Saturday. But Deepawali or Diwali for the Indian community is one specific day of the festival. So Tuesday of this past week was a, was a celebration of the crow. Wednesday was a celebration of the dog. Thursday, actually two parts. Uh, the celebration of the cow during the day and then the goddess of wealth in the evening. Uh, and then um, Friday, the celebration of the oxen. And really the, the probably what I'm learning, and, and again, learning, um, Saturday is the celebration for, for brothers and sisters. And so um, there have been many debates, the information I received, debates on the festival days. Some want to stick to the, 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 the Nepal time of these festivals. Others are willing to, the, to jump to the U.S. time of the festivals. So uh, we may hear from students that they're observing festivals on different days, um, and that would be why that, that would occur. Um, the first couple of days are not as significant. Uh, nor is the fourth day. The third day is really important, but not until the evening uh, with the celebration of goddess. And then really the celebration of brothers and sisters. Uh, that's one of the bigger days. So uh, for, for the, the families in our community, and again, there, we, we have a growing number of families um, from the uh, Nepal or Indian descent, um, congratulations. And I hope you have, have been having uh, a wonderful celebration this week, and I hope it continues through tomorrow. Uh, so, some news coming from around the district. Uh, Mr. Tomaszewski and, and, and the, the gang at Baller High School wanted, wanted to share that some fantastic work beginning around lessons, lesson study at Baller High School. They, uh, the, the faculty has begun to engage in this work. And it's really the opportunity um, to review student learning outcomes, to re review the standards, the curriculum, kind of going back to that topic we just had a couple times ago. Uh, where we're reviewing what each each other are teaching within within the department, um, and during the implement implementation of lessons, uh, teachers from across the the department observe the lessons that each other are teaching, and then collect data and share that data on how students are learning. Now the 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 old idea of you know essentially all learning happens behind a closed classroom door. It's really trying to tear down those stereotypes or tear down those silos and then really to open up learning and get some really constructive feedback about what we do and how we do it. Um, so then following the lessons, the teams will be brief. They establish questions or problems uh, to reinvestigate the lesson and really be critical, um, constructively critical about the work that we do. Uh, this takes a lot of time getting to this point. It requires a schedule that provides time for teachers to get together. It takes a philosophy or at least an environment where teachers are comfortable working with each other to this degree. A lot of teachers are very shy about their craft in front of their peers. I know that sounds crazy because teachers are really on the stage, right? 
they're on stage in front of the kids. But I've seen teachers perform incredibly in front of kids, in front of children, and there, there's no inhibition. They're really they're they're just they're just really like almost an, an actor on a stage. But when they get in front of adults, especially parents, uh, they get nervous. They get nervous, um, and so it is about breaking down those barriers and doing doing this work so we can get better at what we do and really think critically about it. A couple of reminders coming up. First nine weeks officially ends today, which is Friday, November 5th. Report cards will be issued next Friday on the 12th, and the second nine weeks begins um, on Monday the 8th. A couple of questions. There was a question about uh, teachers in the classrooms only having access uh, to local phone numbers and not having access to long distance phone numbers. Um, I think that's become probably more of an issue with folks who um, have cell phone numbers that don't have a 412 or a 724 area code. Um, I know our phone system years ago was set up that way um, just to kind of keep a handle on um, the, the cost for long distance, uh, whether that's teachers making calls, which really is not um, that much of a concern. But we have classroom, we have phones in every classroom. And so at times we were running into the problems where uh, children were, were making calls and then uh, the district was getting hit with a, a financial burden uh, that they really didn't need to have, to have. So I can take a look at that with our technology department. Um, but the offices and conference rooms uh, do have access, uh, the phones that can access long distance. So coming out of the schools, there are options for this to occur. Um, and again, I've not addressed this or had, had this conversation for quite some time. But even with uh, prior phone systems, each individual classroom, we didn't want that opened up. But again, conference rooms and especially office areas, uh, there, there was the ability to make those long distance calls. There's a question about how will sick days post COVID vaccines be handled or coded? I'm going to take the, the, the position that you're talking about um, now that we're doing the clinics for younger children uh, or the, the vaccines available for younger children. Um, that if, if folks have side effects from the shot. Uh, can students work remotely? Can they get their class work uh, the day before? Um, what we, we have been doing is really the class work, is the day before of taking all the books home or getting the work from the teacher, it kind of is a pre-COVID type of thing because on Canvas, all of the work is there. The teachers are required and responsible to have active, relevant, up-to-date Canvas pages. And so at any time that a student might forget something, uh, that Canvas page really should be a resource for them. Uh, working remotely, if, if children are not doing well, of course they can work remotely. There is a question down a little bit further uh, in regard to how will that day be coded. Um, I will get some answers on that. I don't have an answer, so I'm not going to I'm not going to make something up uh, and, and be incorrect on that. But let me take a look at that um, and whether that would be a, a, a like a quarantine type of day. Cause the question that that is asked, and let me find it, is if one of those there it is. Um, if they would miss school due to side effects, does it go, go against their 10 days before doctor's excuse is required? So let me get a little bit more information on that, and um, I'll answer that for next week, if not before. Um, there's a question about why have we not done a poll to parents uh, for the effectiveness or the convenience or lack of convenience in regard to the remote days? Uh, I think I actually it's a great idea. Typically with polls, um, when I put them out, people have a little bit of experience about what I'm polling them for. And, and I think that we've done enough remote days out of necessity, um, you know, getting shut down, those types of things that folks can give feedback on the remote days. Just this week, we had our first two scheduled remote days. Uh, so uh, I, I think it probably would be a great idea that as we wrap up this month, I know we're just starting it, but we have a couple more that are coming up due to conferences and then uh, the day right before the, the Thanksgiving break, uh, that within the month of November to put a poll together and get that out. Um, because I do want these days to be productive for everybody. There, there, there isn't a productiveness in the, in the calendar overall because um, overall folks want us to, to start school as late as possible, preferably after Labor Day, but if it's finished before Memorial Day or, or at the Memorial Day time. It's very tough to do that when you have different days off in between. And, and so things like election day where we don't want to mix voters with students in a school at the same time, um, otherwise we'd be shut down and closed and then we'd have to just tack that day on somewhere else. And um, 
So we're just trying to, to serve many, many needs. Uh, but but that, that's a good idea. We'll get that out. Couple questions. I think this is all a question in, in and around the vaccination that the child's missing school due to the side effects. Uh, yeah, it, it is. Sorry, just for a minute to, to make sure I was on the right question and answering correctly. That if there's you know the one shot, two shot, you know a booster, all that type of thing, uh, there's potentially quite a number of days that could be missed. Uh, so how is the district going to handle this new challenge? And, and we've had the older children vaccinated up to this point. I've not been aware that um, that the older children being able to be vaccinated up to this point. I shouldn't say that we've had them vaccinated because people are going to misread that statement because we have not done anything. We have provided an opportunity for them to be vaccinated. Uh, and so I'm not aware of a significant uh, attendance issue around the vaccines that have already been able to be received. But let me ask that. Let me get those questions taken care of. Uh, question around. Uh, does the district have plans to hire more school police officers um, and would i like to see a full-time officer in each building and i think that's a really it's a great question and, and the answer is not as simple as, a, as an easy yes or, or an easy no um, what i've seen from other districts that have put police officers in every building uh, is that the the importance of of security for everybody changes that it's a change of mindset that if there's a police officer in the school, then security is their job. It's not my job anymore. There's somebody hired to do security. And so security is only good in a school when everyone plays a part. Because a police officer can't be everywhere. The size of our buildings, you think about think about the size of any of our schools. Yes, if it's a, if it's a police officer that is armed, then there is a a, friend, a friendly gun in the school board. That's, that's tough even to say, but um, a lot of the reasons of putting police officers in schools for that first response. Uh, but what I've also seen is that, you know, think, of, think about uh, Harrison for that matter. If the police officer is up near entrance number, uh, number 12, which is around the office area, and there's a problem all the way down at, uh, by the shop, the shop entrance, which is where we have second grade and, and some first grade classrooms and such, um, you know, there's there's no possible way for them to get there that fast or, or just stop something. So, um, if doors start to be left open, because hey, if security is not my not my concern anymore, we've we've seen over time in different places that the overall focus on security for everybody starts to d diminish. Um, Alice training that, that we've been doing through the course of November, uh, of October and then stretching into November has been outstanding because you really, everyone, security is everyone's business. Everyone's responsible to make sure that door was closed. Everyone's responsible to make sure that that uh, we, we have the ability to lock our doors. We can barricade, that we're questioning. We have the Raptor system, and we're just upgrading the Raptor system um, as we speak during this exact time. So we're, we're able to monitor who comes in. We have secure vestibules that no one's able to get into our buildings uh, without having to go through the office area. So there. There is no, uh, probably a terrible analogy, but there's no silver bullet to school security. But I think there are silver BBs. There's a lot of little things that you can do and that you should be doing that actually makes the, the, the system stronger than just one thing and, and, and as an officer. So um, I'm hesitant to have a full-time officer in every building. Um, I think the systems that we've had in place have been quite, quite strong. Um, I've also been asked, where are you with metal detectors? Why don't you put metal detectors? Um, my own, my professional and personal philosophies, metal detectors will change the climate of your school and not for the better. Every child, when if a child has to walk through a metal detector every day, what I've seen and read in studies, and I've seen it first firsthand from, from my peers who have it, it says to that child, I don't trust you. I have to check. And on a daily basis, that does change school environments. Um, today on, on, on 11 4, so that would have been yesterday, I received an email that my student, that a student in my son's class tested positive for COVID, and the last day in the classroom was on 10 22. 
11 4 10 22 just kind of restate that so why getting those uh, letters two weeks after I mean, it really makes no sense and you're right it doesn't make any sense um, but a lot of the factors that affect the, those timelines are outside of our delay or outside of our our, um, our ability to control for that delay um, some some of the delay is our fault and i'm not going to throw stones there are times where we're working through many cases and and letters get delayed by a day maybe by two days so i'm i'm, I'm not you know saying i'm excused or or my team's excused from any of that but sometimes we what we end up getting is the notice from the parents is being so late and it's not negligence it's just that the child started staying home because they had the sniffles they weren't feeling well a couple days later they go get tested a couple days after that the test comes back and so now it's a whole week later a week and a half later because now you've got a weekend in between and now we're just getting notice back from the family because they're just getting notice that the child that their child was positive for COVID. and so i think the communication that we're, we're, we're getting from parents has been outstanding again i keep referencing other districts and other super intendants you know, complaining about the contact tracing folks don't want to answer the phone the phones they won't return phone calls we get some of that but for the most part folks are really um, cooperative in making sure that the right information is out there but some of those delays are really um, just at the mercy of the timelines and when information is available i apologize for that but it's we, we're, the things that we have control over we'll try to get those tighter things that we don't have control over i'm not sure what we can do about that uh and the last question when does the board answer the community i know we are welcome to make public comments during board meetings um, however we're often reminded that it's not question and answer time but when we email uh, we we don't hear back either um, i don't know if i if me as a person if i'm um, lumped into that you know the board category um, i do believe that i try to answer all emails in a timely manner um, do i miss something do i miss some sure um, with 500 emails a day there's times that i miss them um, if there's something that i've not answered please let me know if there are things that the board is not answering I'll, I'll talk to the board about um, their email i know everyone has uh, has access to their email um, but you know, the, you're right the public comment uh, when there are questions that are posed there uh, i do have the opportunity to speak after public comment so um, even just this past week there there were a couple questions that were posed and i answered them and so I try. I will try to do that because I, I don't want any misinformation is out there, or I don't want a question just kind of hanging out there and, and left open ended. Um, I try not to get back into a back and forth um, because I think that that kind of goes against what the, the concept of public comment or resident comment is, is all about. Uh, because I also don't want to be partial. That okay, I, but I answer the easy questions. I don't want to answer the hard ones, or I, I I only respond to the positive things and not the negatives. Um, so all of that will end up being what, what gets thrown about. So um, I'll bring this up. I'll ask the question. And um, ultimately, uh, everyone's in control of their own email, and, and they can respond that as they wish. So once again, thank you for, for tuning in uh, to either today live or, or jumping on a little bit later uh, when it's convenient to you. Continue to be safe. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful weekend, a little chilly, but beautiful. So please hope you can enjoy some of that. Uh, be kind to one another. Show some grace and and remember uh, we are open and we're doing some great things in western pennsylvania that we should be proud of and, and we should not forget about those so thank you so until next week hope you have a great week